So this is 2011 um, speech at the convention of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. It's very important. If I'm thinking audience, this is 1905. This is primarily not just American women, but American women suffragists, right? American women activists, people who cared about the right to vote. Now we know because we have like a broader view that in 1920, women get the right to vote. At the time in 1905, they don't know if and when they're going to get it, right? They're fighting for it. So that's important to keep in mind. Florence Kelly actually calls an audible. I, I think she does this deliberately. She comes into the, the Women's Suffrage Association. She talks about child labor laws. By the end of her speech, she ties it into the right to vote. Um, so actually, I think that was a really unique way to, to tie that together. But she was an activist who cared about both women's rights and child rights. So let's look at one paragraph of her, from her speech today. Um, look at what not to do, and then what's the better option. I hope this is helpful. What really matters is that you take today's live session and you apply it um, when you actually are writing. All right, so she says, nor is it only in the South that these things occur. So I'll tell you, this is out of context, obviously, but these things are all the terrible ways that child are treated in the workforce. That's, that's really all you need to know for, for our sake today. Alabama does better than New Jersey. For Alabama limits the children's work at night to eight hours, while New Jersey permits it all night long. Last year, New Jersey took a long backward step. A good law was repealed, which had required women and children to stop work at six in the evening and at noon on Friday. Now, therefore, in New Jersey, boys and girls after their 14th birthday enjoy the pitiful privilege of working all night long. All right. I've seen so many essays written on this speech as well. Students love the alliteration and the diction of, of that last sentence. Pitiful privilege. Um, I didn't write that on the matching game, but I saw that so many times. Certainly, that word choice was so deliberate. I don't have a whole lot to say about it alone in isolation. It's all about how are these things working together. So, so many students would say, okay, there's concrete evidence. She's just citing what happens in Alabama and New Jersey. It's a juxtaposition. Um, juxtaposition actually is a word that I recommend you all knowing. Here's why. Remember I said juxtaposition was a side-by-side -side comparison of two different things. I recommend you use the verb juxtaposes. So don't just say, Kelly uses juxtaposition. But in your analysis, when you're seeing how all these things fit together, say, okay, so Kelly juxtaposes the problems in New Jersey in the north with the problems of Alabama in the south and then go off of how that would impact your audience. So juxtaposition is a nice word to know, but again, that's not the point here today. And then obviously emotional appeal. So many students would, would write a paragraph on all three of those, but talk about them in isolation. And you're selling yourself a little bit too short there. Again, how much am I really going to say about concrete evidence if I'm not talking about everything else that's going on at the same time? So I want you all moving from the speech from beginning, middle, and end and talk about the trend that's happening at the beginning the trend that's happening at the middle, the trend that's happening at the end, and talk about all of the pieces that you see that work towards that trend. Don't write about the pieces unless you're writing about how they're working together. So again, don't write a body paragraph on concrete evidence. Write a body paragraph on the overall trend. So again, if this was a matching game, uh, these might be my three body paragraphs. But if that was the case, I'd probably be getting a three or a four because I'm not not controlling like a high level reading or analysis of the text then. This is not a matching game. Instead, let's, let's look for the writing trend. This would be my topic sentence. Uh, I bolded it just to make a point here, the word national. Kelly emphasizes that the problem of child labor is a national problem. Okay, so that's what she's emphasizing. All of these things fit together. So you'll see in my writing trends in my topic sentence, it's what is the author highlighting, emphasizing, focusing on, criticizing, things like that. So strong verbs are going to be the key here. I don't have a slide on this, but I want you all to, to really listen in on this part. I do not let my students use the word use or uses because that's listy. That, that's getting back to emotional appeal. Students who use use say, Kelly, let's go back, uses concrete evidence. Kelly uses juxtaposition. Kelly uses pathos. I don't want you using uses. I want you using better verbs. 
Kelly emphasizes or Kelly critiques, etc. Okay, so just look at how all of those pieces that we identified with a matching game work to, towards that um, general trend. The emotional language, the evidence chosen, the juxtaposition, all work to show this is a national problem. I want to take another minute here to think about high-level analysis. I said at the beginning today that you have to think about the audience and what the audience would think before the speech. So here, the audience is, is a lot of women activists in 1905 in Philadelphia at a convention. Kelly comes in. She knows exactly who they are. She's one of them, essentially, right? But she, in her speech, kind of calls them out for ignoring the problem of child labor. Like, that, that's part of what her speech is. Obviously, we're just looking at a paragraph of it. She says a lot in her speech, okay, we're part of the problem because we're buying the things that the children are producing in factories at night in these terrible working conditions. So this is very important to think about. Her audience doesn't, I, I don't think that they don't care. I don't even think they recognize it as a problem. So she knows that going in. Here's, here's a higher level thought. They're in Philadelphia. They're in the north. This is 1905. This is not super far off from the Civil War that tore our country apart. The northerners still think we're northerners and they're southerners and vice versa. So she's at a northern city at this convention. Most people, and by the way, like the north was more progressive, so there'd be a lot more women suffragettes in the north. She thinks, and she knows, that a lot of people in the audience are going to think, yeah, those southerners in 1905, they're backwards. They're, they're like behind the times. We're progressive. We're advanced. Look at what she does in this excerpt. It is not just in the South that these things occur. She is addressing their beliefs head on here. She doesn't come out and say, I know what you all think. She just knows what they think, so she addresses it. In fact, she says, Alabama does better than our neighbor to the uh, east, New Jersey another northern state. So she is completely um, meeting them where they are and challenging their kind of preconceptions here. The best analysis is going to include that. So that's not my focus today, but this is a really good one to kind of start thinking about. What does the audience already think about the subject of child labor? Again, they think it's, they're not really thinking about it, maybe. They're not really thinking about it as a problem. And they're definitely thinking, well, it can't be as bad as it is in the South. She's saying, okay, no, it's actually worse here than in the South at times. All right, so th those are things I want you thinking about. You would tell me, Kelly emphasizes um, that the problem of child labor is a national problem, and then tell me how the audience thinks originally and how she uses emotional language evidence in juxtaposition of the North and the South to change their mindset. So our fourth of five practice rounds, not an AP prompt. It's the really recent, September 1st, 2018, Former President Obama delivered the eulogy of John McCain. Here's a paragraph from that. Obviously, you know um, that John McCain and Obama were on opposite sides of the, of the political spectrum. John McCain often disagreed with Obama, yet they had a professional relationship where Obama was the one giving one of the ones giving his eulogy. So let's read. Uh, that's kind of what Obama's talking about here. On the surface, John and I could not have been more different. We're of different generations. I came from a broken home and never knew my father. John was a scion of one of America's most distinguished military families. I have a reputation for keeping cool. John, not so much. We were standard bearers of different American political traditions. And throughout my presidency, John never hesitated to tell me when he thought I was screwing up, which by his calculation, was about once a day. So obviously what, what jumps out at me is the juxtaposition of John and Obama, how contrasted they are, how different they are. And the repetition, the sentence structure certainly is to build that repetition. But if all I do is write about repetition, I don't have a whole lot to say. I have to look at the greater writing trend. So if this was a matching game. I'd say, yeah, I see juxtaposition. I see repetition. But this is not a matching game. Instead, we're looking for the writing trend. 
here's what I would say, and this actually would be my topic sentence. I kind of flushed this one out a little bit more. Before launching into their similarities, which is what Obama does next, Obama details the many differences between him and McCain. Now, just be careful. What comes next is the analysis. My writing trends, if, if, if that's all you're focusing on, you're not analyzing after, you could slip into summary. Summary is going to get you a one or a two on this one to nine scale. So I can't just do this, right? But that's the writing trend that I see. He's detailing, and look at my verb again, before launching into their similarities, Obama details the many differences between him and McCain. Now, I've just got to think about the audience. That's really the focus um, for future weeks. But again, how is sentence structure and juxtaposition working together to show this? Now, the reason I fleshed out this topic sentence for you is you can see if you feel like you're ready to start practicing in class, what it would look like to look at the beginning of an essay or a speech, the middle of an essay, and the end of an essay. So this one would probably be, uh, maybe let's say it's the second body paragraph I have. Ideally, I have three body paragraphs. Realistically, um, you might only have time for two. 40 minutes to do this um, essay is, is going to go really quickly. You can write two body paragraphs um, very effectively and get a nine. Ideally, you just are securing your, your score by writing three beautiful body paragraphs. But just I, a little side note here, but three body paragraphs are great. But if they're kind of average, I'd rather have two beautiful body paragraphs. So just keep that in mind. So this would be maybe, let's say, my first or second body paragraph before launching into their similarities. So my next body paragraph would be about their similarities. It would be like, okay, so after establishing how different they were, Obama, blah, 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 talking about their similarities. The purpose of the speech we have to identify, we'd have to look at it in, in context, write the whole speech. Um, but in this paragraph, that's what's worth writing about, the differences that he's highlighting or detailing. For this one, we're just going to look at um, two sentences. So let's read. 19 years ago, almost to the day, we lost three astronauts in a terrible accident on the ground. But... We've never lost an astronaut in flight. We've never had a tragedy like this. So if you saw me unpack um, Reagan's speech a couple weeks back, we talked about as after he like mourned with the audience, he actually shifts his speech to say, and, and again, I'm just giving you a little bit of context here. He shifts his speech to say, okay, I know this was a tragedy, but we're going to continue to pursue space exploration, and here's why. Right? So that's kind of like the, the bigger purpose of a speech. It's both to mourn with the astronauts, families, and the nation as a whole, but also to recommit to space exploration, even in um, the wake of tragedy. All right, so this is a matching game. I'm like, okay, concrete evidence. He's talking about losing three astronauts before. That's a, that's a real event. Repetition. We've never lost. We've never had. Right. That, that's repetition. That's not enough, right? This is not a matching game. Here's what I would do. Reagan highlights the uniqueness of this, this tragedy. Again, keeping in mind, he wants um, the audience to know that he's mourning with them, but also he's recommitting the U.S. space exploration program. So the evidence cited about um, losing astronauts before in the past and the sense of structure, the repetition, are really used for that purpose, highlighting the uniqueness of the tragedy. In my analysis, I have to say, here's what the audience is thinking before the speech. Here's how Reagan is deliberately using strategies as a writer to get them on his side. So he's highlighting the uniqueness of the tragedy. So in my analysis, I'm saying, why would he do that? Well, to, to recognize, like, this is a terrible, terrible thing. It's a, it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing, right? Um, or once in a generation thing, you could say. It's a terrible thing, but that's not going to stop us from looking at the bigger picture. That, that, that's in part what he's doing there.